This is an open meeting. As you come in the door, right around the corner is the actual open meeting act. We're going to ask if you would join with us in a moment of silence and the Pledge of Allegiance. If you will please stand. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And we'll continue with roll call. Coy? Here. Lange? Here. Merrill? Here. Clausen? Here. Murin? Here. Moaning? Here. Faust? Here. File? Here. <coughs> All right, and I would ask for approval of the consent agenda. So moved, Your Honor. Second. A motion with a second to approve the consent agenda as presented you. Please vote. All council members voting in the affirmative. And as well, I would request approval of the full agenda as provided you. So moved, Your Honor. Second. Motion with a second again. Please vote. All council members voting in the affirmative. Okay. We're going to start off with some special presentations tonight. First of all, is a fair housing proclamation. Whereas April 11, 2014 marks the 46th anniversary of the passage of the U.S. Fair Housing Law, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1968, as amended, which, in, which enunciates a national policy of fair housing without regard to race, color, creed, national origin, sex, familiar status, and handicap, and encourages fair housing opportunity for all citizens. And whereas the Norfolk Housing Agency and the Norfolk Housing Development Division of the City of Norfolk are committed to highlight the Fair Housing Law, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1968, by continuing to address discrimination in our community, to support programs that will educate the public about the right to equal housing opportunities, and to plan partnership efforts with other organizations to help ensure every American of their right to fair housing. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Sue Fookman, Mayor of the City of Norfolk, Nebraska, by the power vested in me, do hereby proclaim April 2014 as Fair Housing Month. <coughs> Is there anyone here that's going to receive this this evening? Okay, Beth, but you make sure it gets to the right. Next, we have a presentation by our Trails Advisory Board. Looks like John Downey is going to be the speaker of. John, do you want to take, though, the opportunity to recognize those that are here with you as far as your advisory group? Um, the two that are here, if you go ahead and stand up and introduce yourself. I am Danelle McEwen. And I'm Jane Downey. Anybody else? Sam Stop. And Stop. Okay. Um, as, a, as a trails committee, we were put together to try to advise you all on uh, how we thought might best some uh, money that you'd earmarked for the Trails Committee be spent. Uh, we've met uh, three or four times and uh, come up with what we think is a pretty workable solution for us to get started on, a, on what we hope will be an ongoing process of adding uh, recreational trails to the, around the city of Norfolk. Uh, we've had a lot of public input uh, as individuals on how we, how folks thought that this money should be spent or what people would like to see done eventually. Uh, what we came up with was something that we thought would be a, a very good starting place, something that would uh, show the, the citizens of the city of Norfolk and the surrounding communities uh, what it is that uh, the city of Norfolk would like to get accomplished with this and uh, to try to make a good splash, so to speak. So uh, the, the one that's up on the screen right now was the first of two proposals that we have. Uh, it's marked option C2, which really won't mean a whole lot to you unless you know the history of, of how we came about this particular selection. Um, if, you, if you can get a general idea of where this is at, what runs down through the center of that is the North Fork of the River. Um, to the top right portion of that is Kings Lane. Um, on the clear, I'm sorry, top left, uh, 
on the left side of it, the angle street there is Riverside Boulevard. And the, the main north and south street that kind of angles off to the bottom there is North 3rd Street. Uh, the very top left corner of that would be Dave Faust's business, uh, the convenience store there. To the very top center is uh, the, one of the soccer fields for the YMCA. And then that gray area there at the top is the parking lot on the south edge of the YMCA, the gravel parking lot. And then that very north street is uh, Georgia. Yeah, yeah, the gra that's Gravel Street there at Georgia. Uh, what we proposed was to connect to the bridge that goes across the North Fork of the River there, just to the east <coughs> of the convenience store, and uh, to construct a short segment of trail that connects the bridge and the existing sidewalk there to the east over to North 3rd Street. And then extending down North 3rd Street along the east side of it with a dedicated bike lane, uh, which amounts to painting off a three to four foot section along the east side of North 3rd Street. To uh, dedicate that as a, I'm gonna refer to as a bike lane, probably out of habit, but it'll be a, a bike pedestrian lane. Uh, as a designated safe area for folks to use for uh, bicycle or uh, pedestrian transportation. It would extend all the way down North 3rd Street to Elm Avenue, where the trail would connect to the existing sidewalk on the north side of Elm, across the bridge on the existing bridge on Elm Street, to another new section of trail that would go right along the west side of the North Fork of the River, uh, behind the tennis courts, behind that parking lot there, behind the basketball court, and eventually come out south of Wattier's Auto Body where it would connect to the existing sidewalk uh, along Riverside Boulevard, and then north, <coughs> north again up to where it would eventually connect with the bridge, the existing trail, and the bridge um, in what would generally be Georgia Avenue. Does that, does that make any sense at all? It makes perfect sense in my head. <laughs> it may not make sense to you if you don't, if you don't understand the layout. Uh, that was a, uh, a uh, up to a 50,000, correct me if I'm wrong, gentlemen, on the price on this, somewhere between 30 and $50,000. Actually, it's a combination of those two, about 80,000. 80,000, okay. Uh, and so what, what we were trying to accomplish was that was to, uh, Try to build on what a lot of folks already use as a as a uh, as a route for running, for cycling, things like that from the YMCA. There is just a ton of folks that park at the YMCA, members, non-members, and take off to go run from there. Uh, but there's no there's no truly dedicated loop for this. This would generally create one. Um, I'm told that eventually the the bridge across. Uh, the North Fork of the River on Elm will be uh, improved. I mean, that, that's something that's, that's looked at in the not too distant future, although I don't believe that it's slated, and I can't speak for that at all. Um, but anyway, this makes for a nice loop, nice safe loop. There's a little bit of scenery involved there, and it gives us a good starting place and kind of a kind of a look at this, look what we're trying to do, uh, some place to hang your hat on. Any questions on that from you folks? John, approximately how far a distance is that around that loop? It should be about two miles, okay. give or take just a little bit. Thank you. And John, the one thing you said with, with using the, the parking in the road and on, the, on that street, you're saving a lot of money by not having to put <coughs> another sidewalk and spend a lot of money. I mean, 80000 is a lot of money. But if you had to spend that where the, we're going to use the street and, and the existing sidewalk, probably cut that in the third, though. I, I would assume so. Yeah, the, uh, painting a stripe on the road, you know, I'm going to say this in the simplest of terms, painting the stripe on the road is considerably cheaper than pouring concrete um, and a lot quicker, obviously, and, and, and impacts a lot less uh, people. Just so we're clear on that, we paint that stripe, paint the stripe on Third Street there, but the parking would be eliminated on that side of the street. But one thing that's is nice about that general area is there's only one or two homes that uh, have their driveways that are actually going on to Third Street. So it's a pretty wide open street right now. So 
as far as that there isn't a large parking contingent on that street. So eliminating the parking along there shouldn't be overly traumatic, and we'd be able to open that up again for that bike run lane. One thing to keep in mind with this is that um, if you've thought about it or if you're unaware, this would be the first dedicated lane like this in the city of Norfolk, that, yes. the absolute first one. Um, it's These are not, to, if you don't know, these types of lanes are, are pretty uh, prolific in the larger cities. There's getting to be a lot of them in Omaha. There's a, there's a real push for them in Lincoln. Lincoln and Omaha both have a, a pretty extensive trail system. Lincoln more so. Uh, if you were of a mind to, you could travel just about anywhere in Lincoln on a trail uh, within a few blocks uh, to get to wherever you're going across the city of Lincoln. And they're using, ex uh, using these bike lanes in the downtown, and they really seem to be working out. The people that I know that use them really like them, and I haven't heard a whole lot of pushback um, on those. So you've got a you've got a B two and a C two. Is there a, a D two or an E two? Well, Does it spider? Do you see something in the future that spiders on out into the neighborhoods going off to the west well, or east? Yeah, or? we do. Um, the idea is is that kind of the the working idea that we have is that all the all the wards generally would be connected to uh, Memorial Field, the the water park, to Tazuka Park. Um, that's that's part of it, you know, so that everything, all those major uh, recreational facilities would be connected and hopefully enhanced in the future, especially Tazuka. Um, and then uh, a, a broader scope of that would be an actual trail of some sort that would circumnavigate the entire city. Um, go from, you know, utilizing the existing cowboy trail, the extension that's going in this year, and then somehow got ideas but it's not it's just kind of a working idea is to loop that overhook on with the flood control trail and then out around the north side of town connecting back with uh berry hill el dorado those northern areas mm -hmm. that there and then back in town that, that's really the ultimate goal is sure. that but that's that's a few years thank you any more questions on this particular piece this is our first reason our first uh, proposal so the bike lane would be on the west side then on third street I mean, on the, east on the east side. On the east side. Yes. Okay. There's a, whole row of, there's a whole row of homes with driveways on the west side. So we were trying to, to get it on a side that would have minimal uh, conflicts of people backing out of their driveway across the, across the lane. One, one thing about that bike lane, I see that you got 10 foot trail, and then is that bike lane, then it's equivalent to that, like 10 foot, is that what you do for your striping? It'll take a parking area that where cars so, would park, so right. seven to eight, eight to eight. Eight, okay. All right. I saw, I was just, like you said, I was in Omaha over the weekend and saw the same thing. They, they've got a Even reason. like Bellevue. Yeah. Bellevue, they've got that running through Bellevue and stuff. So yeah, I saw you know, the same if thing. you start off in uh, extreme northwest mm -hmm. Omaha, uh, almost out into the country, you could probably, if you tried very hard, you could probably get all the way from Bennington to Bellevue on a trail <laughs> without a whole lot of effort. Uh, it's, it's really nice that way. One thing that you'd asked about what we're trying to do is, is uh, you know, if we could connect the college to the major shopping areas in town with a with a bike lane, you know, it's same as the uh, recreational areas. That'd be a rule, in my mind, and I think the folks, the other folks on the trail committee would be of the same mind that that'd be a real boon mm -hmm. um, for everybody. Sure. Anything else on that? If we want to go to the next part of it, I don't want to talk about the post office. There we go. Okay, um, this is uh, this is our second one. It's the more expensive of the two. Um, it actually goes a long ways towards what I just said, which was connecting the college uh, and uh, Woodland Park in Eastern Norfolk to Memorial Field and uh, parts farther west on Paswalk Avenue, which would include. Um, Walmart, Shopco, Menards, all that stuff. Uh, this, because of the, the, the river in there, this trail ends up making a little bit of a loop to the south. But along the very right-hand side of the page there, uh, the straight line that curves off to the right is the flood control. Um, along the bottom is Omaha Avenue. 
And in the top right, I did it again, the top left corner is Memorial Field. So uh, the, the current flood control trail goes along the west side of the flood control and ends up at Omaha Avenue. The, the proposal that we have uh, would come off of the flood control trail, follow along the North Fork of the river, uh, the existing river, and then travel straight west to where it connects with Bluff. And then would go from Bluff, on Bluff Avenue, um, at this point, just utilizing the existing facilities until it connects with the trail that is the, the wide sidewalk, which would become a designated trail, uh, around the east and north side of Memorial Field. Um, this one is, is, is a little hidden. It's not quite as wide you know, out in the open as what the first one is. However, it does then end up connecting all of this area to the flood control trail, to the college, and farther east then it connects it to Woodland Park. Because as you know, the, uh, the Highway 35 project includes a nice trail that goes all the way to Woodland Park, uh, which will just, I think will be for all the folks that live out there that will be able to connect into town. Uh, kids that are old enough to do that to be able to come into town um, just for general exercise and having uh, recreation in town. I think that's just a great thing. And this this really connects it to, uh, connects that flood control trail and that Highway 35 trail to the existing network in town. There's not as much to talk about on this one other than that that's where it's at. and. Uh, uh, we had a, a myriad of options that we had available to us when we started, and uh, these are the two that we came up with. Any other questions on that? John, I don't think I have a question. I just want to say thank you, and thank you to the committee uh, for all your, all your work on this. I think this is a great start for um, re-energizing our trails <coughs> development here in the community, uh, which is important for a lot of reasons. Um, improving our quality of life, uh, economic development, everything. So I know you guys uh, put a lot of work in to uh, think creatively about how to form interior connections with the, within the community. I'm excited about this. I think it's a great start. Thank you. Thank you. Nothing else? I'll, thank you very much. John, thank you very much. And to the rest of you, keep up the good work. And, you know, we're here to support you. And so let us know as you move forward with new thoughts. So. Thanks again, John. Okay, we're gonna move on to then the next presentation, um, which is the architects here on the results of the library space needs study. So, folks. Again, we'll let you introduce yourself for us, if you will. Absolutely. Well, Ryan's getting the um is his the video portion set up. My name is Michael Alley with Alley Pointer Marketo <coughs> Architecture. Is this? Yeah, trying has to be up. Hello? <laughs> is it working? Is the green mic on? Hello? Is he? Can you hear him? If I can get a little closer, is that yeah, better? Yeah, that, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Too tall. <Yeah. laughs> I'm Michael Too Tall Alley <laughs> with Alley Pointer Marketo Architecture. And uh, yeah, it's really, I'm a guy who rides his bicycle to work every day. So I commend you guys for the action you've just taken with the trail system. It it's really is a meaningful thing for the, the community. Also, uh, I think out of all the different types of buildings that we get to work on, there are few building types that impact a community more than a public library. And so we've really enjoyed our opportunity to work with uh, uh, quite a few stakeholders in the community on the library over the past, so oh, roughly six months in developing the plan. And, you know, libraries have changed a lot. Uh, they've, they've come a long way from being a repository of books and a place where people go to read books. Of course, that function still exists, but think about how much information we access on a daily basis, almost minute by minute, and all the different forms that that information comes to us. And so libraries, of course, continue to handle and be a resource for the community of that information. But more than that, they're also considered learning centers and, and social centers for a city. And so 
and and they they do remain a repository of the historic uh, documents and and history of a community. So. So it's really a wonderful type of building and one that we enjoy working on and have had just a, a, an, an incredible experience working with, with mem members of the community on yours. So tonight we're gonna show you uh, <coughs> work of, that's, that will look forward uh, 20 year time frame. Uh, we also are going to show you an incremental step, a halfway step for your consideration as well. We've been very mindful of not only what the needs of the library are today, but then trying to project into the future 20 years. And you know, so we recognize that designing this building, we're, we're designing a building for technology that hasn't even been invented yet, potentially. So we've really been thoughtful about flexibility and that sort of thing I think you'll see in the plans. So with that, I'm going to uh, give the microphone to Nancy Novak. <coughs> Hi, I'm, I'm Nancy Novak, and this is Ryan Fisher. We're going to kind of tag team a, a show for you. Um, some of this uh, has been um, material that we've been building on over that last five or six months. Uh, so we're going to kind of clip through some of the beginnings. Uh, we've shown this to a few town hall sessions and to the city council in a previous <coughs> meeting. Uh, but it sets a good foundation from where we, what we've been doing in the last five or six months, which kind of builds our final study. And basically, this is our uh, space needs analysis and feasibility study looking at the library in the next 20 years. So this first slide shows just, um, this was um, an advertisement that the city of Norfolk had put together. This came from the paper almost 40 years ago. Um, but we're still asking everyone to kind of open their minds, and that's what we did in the last five or six months. Look to the community, look to our stakeholders to see exactly what we wanted this library to be. So uh, we started by looking at our existing facility uh, built in 1977. The existing library is about 22,000 square feet. Um, and a lot has changed over the last 40 years. And it's, uh, we do a lot of different library designs throughout the state of Nebraska. 40 years is typically the mark that we see right where a library starts to kind of burst at the seams and something's got to give. Um, so you're kind of right on target with what we typically will see in other communities. Back in 77, the library was known as a quiet place. It has changed now. The library is more of a place of interaction and collaboration where you can go to find a quiet spot, but really it's much more, um, much more alive and, um, and interactive. Um, and you can see here, there's so many other programs happening in libraries, and we're going to touch base on those. Back in 1977, limited technology, of course, so that has been one of our key struggles in libraries, getting a building that can handle not only what's happening now, but kind of crystal ball and look into that future of what's coming. So we really want in our new libraries technology to be ubiquitous, to be accessible wherever you are in the library, and to handle many different kind of tools. Uh, back in 77, we had very limited programs, so I'm sure you're all very familiar. There's the um, there's a board meeting room that houses about 12 to 14 uh, that's in the back of the library. There's the community room that you can get about 60 people in comfortably. Uh, that maybe has been exceeded a few times and as you'll see uh, many of those people are now spilling into the library itself just to handle the uh, wide variety of programs. And then a children's area that um, back in 77, the children's areas just weren't um, doing the same kind of programmings that are happening, not only in the library of today, but that even in the last 20 years. So here's some great shots of your library hard at work um, for different functions that meeting rooms that couldn't handle those big crowds. And so, uh, you know, stacks are cleared, chairs are cleared, and we've got these large community meetings happening in the, in the core of the library. So as we went through our 20-year projection, um, we assessed the existing conditions of the library. Um, I should mention that uh, Ron Furback is here. We're part of a team with Morrissey Engineering. Morrissey, about four years ago? 2011. 2011, um, did uh, facility upgrades to the library. And we're gonna talk further about that in a little while to show you how we're going to uh, reutilize those same systems. So we're not reinventing what's already been done or doubling suggesting a double cost on, on uh, fixes that have already been made to the library. So we assessed existing conditions both now and then looked at what had been done in the last four years. Uh, researched statistical growth factors for the city and the surrounding community that the library is servicing. Uh, met with the staff, steering committee, 
had a lot of uh, great uh, focus groups, outreach to the community. We really wanted to hit a target, not only of users of the library now, but to find out who isn't using the library and why and what we can do to um, make the library uh, more accessible to more people. We did also uh, conduct online community surveys and then had those distributed at the library and then worked with library plan and standards. So just quickly, uh, some areas that uh, were key that had changed or that had outgrown kind of their functional needs. Service desks that were kind of separate and efficient. Um, children's service desks that were um, now being used for multiple purposes where they were designed and kind of underserved for what we need them to be now. Poor sight lines to the front and circulation areas. Adult collection, um, the library um, has done a fantastic job in managing the collection. And what happens a lot of times when we see libraries that have kind of, you know, busting at the seams is that the staff will often do a really good job of making all of the public areas functioning and accessible and making sure that they're weeding the collections so new collections can come on. As a result, though, a lot of the collections that are still being checked out by the public are being weeded out so they can make room for the new. So even though you walk into the library and it may look like you know, the books are nicely organized and controlled, it's because there's been a lot of weeding going on. As we move to the back of the scenes, and I'm, I'm not going to go through all these points unless you have questions about them, the same happens for the children's collection. Um, and, and so what often takes a hit then is the staff areas because that's not where the public is going. Uh, we have a lot of storage uh, needs. Staff areas are predominantly made up of kind of a Costco style folding table for lack of a, uh, a better description. So just a lot more needs now in the library than we saw 40 years ago. Um, we also are working with the IT department who's been in the library for seven, 17 years, something like that. Um, and trying to make an area for the IT department that is friendly for the public. Right now, they, uh, if you want to visit that department, you kind of come in through a back door area that was originally planned for a more secure access area for the library. IT took over a lot of the storage area when they moved in, and that kind of put a, uh, um, some pressure on the library to you know, find some other storage areas. Uh, but we want to make that IT department so that they're more accessible to the community, that we have entrances in the back and the front that are more secure. <clears throat> and as we look at the existing floor plan, we're just going to point out a couple things on that, um, on the matter of security. Right now, as you come in the front door, um, the first thing that you see as you come into the front of the library often is the bathroom uh, that often have open doors for accessibility and kind of making sure that we can kind of keep eyes on that area. There are only adult bathrooms located up front. Um, they have been up upgraded for accessibility. However, they're not um, sized for the service loads that we have for the patron, um, the amount of people that we have visiting the library and the large uh, community group meetings that we're having at the library now. We're also um, asking the children's area, which is uh, located up front. Typically, we would locate that in a new library in a more secure area that can be kind of controlled where kids have more freedom to kind of run around, but eyes can kind of still be on them. Right now, they're moving through that front door, that front vestibule area, oftentimes on their own to access restrooms. So we're kind of trying to re-envision the library in its existing footprint and beyond to see how we can make these more accessible, more patron-friendly, and uh, safer environments. So as we looked at our 20-year growth factor, we went through the space needs analysis. And we came up with a result, and you can just kind of pan through these, um, with a need of having about a 38,000 square foot library. Right now, we've got the 22,000 square, square feet, and we're looking at a growth factor of about 16,000 square feet to be added. And that's based on our projections for what is needed not only for today, but for 20 years down the road for collections. And collections are a bit of a crystal ball as well. Um, there's uh, a lot of times people will think that collections are shrinking because technology is taking over and we've got Kindles and, and different uh, um, electronic devices that are taking the place of book books. The reality is today books are being published even quicker because technology is making it less expensive and easier to print. So we still have um, collections growing at about three to five percent 
not to mention the 10% that we could put on shelves if we had them right now that have been weeded off um, just for a lack of space, not for a lack of use. Um, so we look at collections. We also have a number of programs, committee, uh, committee meeting rooms, uh, uh, activity and group rooms for the children, teen and tween areas dedicated for different age groups. We're looking at uh, possible genealogy and heritage room and um, group study rooms. Some other places where, we, as we mentioned, the library is now that interactive place that's a lot more open and um, active and louder. Um, and that causes us to want to find some also quiet spaces for private study or group study. So <clears throat> while we were kind of dialing in on you know, the amount of area we needed to add to get to this 20 year growth factor, we were also analyzing the existing site and kind of identifying some options that you know, could be improved upon. So one of these being that the main entrance is basically invisible from uh, 4th Street with it being kind of tucked around the corner and also along with that a book drop that's a little bit inconvenient for both um, users of the library and library staff. Uh, a lack of parking as well um, and a parking lot that's a little bit pinched as it is. Uh, a get poor visibility into the IT department as Nancy talked about a little bit earlier and also an entrance that got kind of icy during the winter time and you know made for some uh, some dicey conditions. And also, you know, like I mentioned, uh, the book drop being in an inconvenient spot and just the limited amount of parking. So you know, w with that, you know, we, we began to think about what we could add to the building and where this new building could go. Um, one option being the bulk of that addition happening in the green space to the north of the existing library and also adding a parking lot along 4th Street to the west. Um, and then, you know, another option being kind of splitting the difference and going addition on the north and south side and again, you know, new parking to the west. And, you know, what, what we settled on was uh, kind of somewhere in between both of these options where we have, you know, the bulk of our main addition happening to the north but also starting to wrap that, you know, on the existing west side of the library uh, and then kind of creating a portico. Uh, and a covered patio area that happens on the south side of the existing building. There was a lot of thought that went into just how far we would ask patrons to um, travel from their car to the front door of the library. And so um, due to um, you, some of the existing parking that was there and wanting to reutilize some of that, um, that, uh, that caused us to look at different ways that we could at least have protective cover to get to that front entrance. And did you... We also had the, do you want to talk about the entrance on Prospect? Oh, sure. Yeah, just the entry into the main parking lot right now is also, I think, uh, a little bit problematic from just pulling in and, and traffic happening with North 4th Street being pretty busy. So what we're proposing is, rather than coming in off of Prospect Avenue like you currently do, uh, kind of aligning with, what's, what is the street here? Uh, I just I forgot the name of that. Burgess? Aligning with Burgess off of North 4th Street, this right here would be your main entry into, you know, this all new parking, which is what, 23 stalls plus another, so it's 40, 48 new stalls, 47 new stalls along the west side, kind of expanding, you know, your existing parking, widening, widening that a little bit, so it's not quite as pinched as it currently is, and then keeping the existing parking back here off of North 3rd Street. Um, from that, also adding a book drop area where uh, library patrons could pull in and drop off a book without having to get out of their car and also pick up a book potentially. Uh, and then so we, we kind of, like Nancy said, we looked at a 10-year growth and a 20-year growth. So this option here is a 10-year growth, which would be 13,000 square feet of addition space. And this option would be that 20-year with 16,000 feet. And really nothing changes. It just kind of... It cuts down on some of the stack area and also cuts down on uh, this exterior courtyard here that happens in the middle that we can talk about once we get to the renderings. No, I, as Ryan mentioned, it's the 10-year the growth still has all of our program needs within it. It's really just the collection growth, but everything else is accounted for. And then just kind of showing both of those options together, what would be the 10-year and what would be the 20-year? 
So the floor plan now um, gives us this great uh, visible sight line. So you, you, now you've got this kind of uh, front door on the main, on the main street there. Um, it's, there's more intuitive wayfinding, not only to get to the library, but once you get in the library, to kind of um, naturally orient yourself to what, uh, where the collections are in the different programs. Um, so as you walk in the, um, the double doors that's, that Ryan is showing there, we now have, um, not unlike how your library is now, where you can access the meeting space um, in that 60-person meeting room after hours, after the library closes. So we're still keeping uh, bathrooms. Um, we have kind of a self-service uh, vending area or uh, touchdown area that would um, allow pa uh, patrons like parents that have little kids in the library that need to you know get a little bottle or something together for them that maybe have multiple age groups that would support different family needs so they weren't having to leave the library to take care of those and then come back um, but also could be kind of a nice uh, pre-function or post-function kind of breakout space in the large group meeting sessions um, area C on the plan there shows then a large group meeting room that could accommodate up to 200 uh, visitors in a lecture style but also would have movable walls so that um, <coughs> day to day functions where we needed um, you know, 50 to 20 person meeting rooms, we could accommodate two or three different breakouts in that area and then walls could be open for larger groups. Uh, we, have, we now have an um, <coughs> adult area located near to the front door, group study rooms, we have five group study rooms. <coughs> As you walk in, you have direct sight lines straight up to the staff area that then also kind of have this panoramic view throughout the library, not only to service patrons better, but to also um, increase security. And then the children's area that's located back in the north corner. Um, teens have a dedicated area that's a little bit more acoustically separated, but still highly visible. Um, and the tweens also kind of have their own kind of special area. <coughs> in addition to that, we have a multi-purpose activity room, story time room for the children, uh, better staff areas that are more acoustically separated from the library, but also more visually connected, so staff can get their work done, but still keep eyes on the front desk in case they need to assist. Um, and then the IT area now has um, their own front door, so you could come into the library, go to kind of a, a suite in the IT area, they also have space, uh, they had a lot of space needs requirements. Uh, larger space, right now if you went into the IT area, a lot of their storage is actually kind of in the corridor. Um, they uh, have outgrown their, um, their storage area and their server room doubles in as well um, <coughs> to accommodate city needs. And we still have controlled access then in the rear, so as um, shipments are coming in both for IT and library, that can happen at the back entrance. And like Ron mentioned too, keeping that you know existing mechanical room and in the same spot, not having to move it, allows us to to reuse the work that's already been done a few years ago. Um, and then you know for this new space is where we would tack on a new mechanical room and kind of just piggyback off of the existing system. So this next slide shows one of the other um, a lot of the feedback that we got from. Uh, our focus group meetings was that there, the, the natural light in the library, the, the little bit of natural light that was there on the south, on the north side, um, has really been kind of taken over by collections. So there's a lot of stacks back there. There's not a lot of great uh, opportunities to sit by a window and kind of look out, especially on the, the beautiful opportunities with all the green space to the north. So this um, slide is a great illustration of what, where the natural light forces would be coming in. Um, we, of course, have that large kind of L-shaped uh, skylight that exists on the library now. So that's what you're seeing over the circulation desk and uh, new print material. But then as well as natural light coming into those community rooms, into the IT area, that front entrance, the kind of cafe vending, and this great uh, opportunity to maybe um, uh, push this kind of atrium space into the north end of the library, allowing even more natural light to come in on the adult, teens, and children's area, and some also some great opportunities to have some controlled outdoor areas. Let programs spill when the spill outside when the weather is nice. Have different reading programs or knitting groups or book clubs that really could get that kind of indoor outdoor um, accessibility to the library. So we felt pretty strongly um, when we started this that 
the new building should have its own personality and you know feel kind of decidedly new but that we also needed to be contextual of the existing library and kind of respect what's there so one thing we tried to do was was play off of some of the the elements of that library that we really liked um, one being kind of the overall massing the existing kind of low roof line matching that with our main edition and also matching kind of the skylight portion of the existing library that pops up with the, the bigger edition on the north side. Um, we really liked kind of the repetition that the existing library has with the, uh, the precast panel lines. You know, it has kind of a, a rhythm to it that we felt was pretty nice. So we tried to play off that with some of the new window openings and some of these, you know, reveals in the exterior material that we're showing. Um, what you're looking at here, that kind of colonnade to the yes. south, is that um, canopy area. Yeah. So that would get you under kind of a protected walkway if you were coming from the uh, east side of the parking lot back in the back area around to the front and then just to the left uh, before you see that roof line come forward is our main, our new front entry um, and you'll see an evening shot in a little bit that shows that community room on that uh, uh, southwest, southwest corner uh, where we get some great light into the community room but also the opportunity for the community room to even spill out um, outside where you could have these kind of covered canopy with some seat uh, tables and chairs outside. And just a fairly, a fairly inexpensive way to, to not just kind of slam a new portion, a new building right up next to the old one and it kind of, you know, wraps around and, and kind of filters out rather than just stopping abruptly. So somewhat of the same view you can see, you know, kind of through this covered portico area that connects both uh, east and west parking lot main entry here, um, study rooms here, and then kind of the bulk of the stacks happening back here. And you can see uh, with the roof line here matching up with that existing skylight roof line here. That whole lot of green space here. Um, Nancy mentioned the, the courtyard that we talked about that kind of separates, uh, physically separates the adult reading collection and the children's reading collection. But you know, kind of carving this thing into the building uh, it really allows that separation to happen, but still keeping a visual connection. So, you know, someone that's that's reading a book can kind of sit and and watch the children what they're doing happening across the way. Um, so this is a view from the green space, the existing green space, kind of looking back <clears throat> at that. Excuse me, at that uh, courtyard area happening in the middle here, and then children's collection and adult collection. Similar view to that first one. Um, this one's showing some of the new windows that we'd be pop punching into the existing wall to allow natural light into the IT offices. If you wanna. And this is a shot in the adult area uh, that could be a nice reading room uh, next to that natural light looking over that north view. Um, <coughs> and, you know, this is the time for us to kind of dream big when we're at this kind of uh, research stage. So, you know, anything from, uh, you know, this nice kind of uh, brick material coming in, the introduction of a fireplace to create that nice welcoming reading area. And then as Ryan mentioned earlier, you can see now, it almost looks like you're looking um, straight through that atrium. You can start to see a little bit of the stacks back there, which would be the children's area. So everyone gets to share this kind of atrium space, but it creates this really nice uh, audible situ uh, uh, separation between the, the different age groups. And similar to the existing skylight, which allows the natural light, you know, to get into the, like the deepest portion of the building, I think this, this atrium would do the same, where you don't have windows, you know, kind of just along the perimeter, you actually get some of that natural light in the middle of your new building. Okay, so we uh, then had been, uh, we've had various stages of cost estimates throughout this uh, process, and um, we're working with a uh, cost estimate Estimator is on our team, Dennis C., who does a lot of our uh, cost estimating for multiple projects, but specifically libraries as well. And uh, with the 20 year projection, um, with uh, both soft costs and um, furnishings and equipments for the library, um, our estimated cost, um, if we were to construct this in a year, there'll be an escalation factor beyond the year, would came in at about $7,442,000 for the renovation and expansion of the library. So once we got our numbers back for this, that's when we started to take a look and see what, uh, 
what happens if we look at a 10-year projection so that we could have some options. So looking at a 10-year projection, uh, only cutting on the, um, the actual um, printed material um, took about 3,000 square feet out of the building. And with that, um, our numbers came in then at about six and a half million for a 10-year projection. So uh, our final deliverable for the space needs uh, assessment is uh, kind of taking us up to date then with kind of some uh, uh, both uh, 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 programmatic ideas on where the library wants to go. Um, visually what that could look like and then our cost estimates. Um, there'll be a, a larger packet that's provided to um, the city and the library um, at the end of this study and after tonight's meeting we'll, we'll have that deliverable. Um, but that brings us up to speed for, um, for where we're at with this study. And um, if you have any questions, we'd love to hear them. <laughs> I guess uh, one question I had, did we look at the feasibility of building a second library, a freestanding auxiliary library, as opposed to the addition on the existing library? To just to start new, we didn't. Okay. No, um, we were tasked with looking at, um, uh, look at the existing facility and working with that facility. Okay. Um, and, it, and it came pretty naturally because of that ballpark area mm -hmm. that's to the north. Um, we've, we've done a number of these where site has been kind of an issue and you're, a lot of times you're landlocked. This, and the north light is fantastic for reading, so it was, it was really teed up nicely for us to, to reuse. One, one thing that I would say is that, you know, there's such an investment that the city's already made in the existing building and really very serviceable components that uh, we felt like it would you know, good, it's good stewardship to take advantage of the investment that the city's already made, and so that's one of the reasons we really focused on this as well. Okay. And the, um, Ron, I don't know if you want to say a word about the work that was done sure. just lighting. four years ago with the mechanical system and lighting that was upgraded. I guess that might be good information for other folks, but I'm, I'm aware yeah. of that already. <laughs> but I mean, but if certainly. you... Yeah. you I mean, I, I think maybe some folks in the audience might, it yep. might be helpful. i go ahead and... Okay. Well, as Nancy and Ryan have already mentioned, we, in 2011, we worked with city staff to come up with a replacement for the heating, ventilating, and air conditioning system in the library. Um, I, like I said to the public, everybody remember this summer, it wasn't air conditioned, it was <laughs> pretty brutal, but um, in working with them, we had a couple of goals. One was that we put a system that would be least disruptive to the users of the library, and more importantly, that it would be a system that could be serviced by local contractors. We ended up with a system called variable refrigerant flow, and I'll try not to get too detailed here, but it's a state-of-the-art air conditioning system that is incremental and it's expandable. So all the work that we did in that project in 2011 is, is in place, will not be replaced, we won't tear anything out. It'll just be expanded to serve any additions or maybe remodels that you do. Um, we had a young intern working for us then to use the library with your staff's help to study it for his uh, master's thesis at the University of Nebraska's Engineering College. And he studied the energy use of that building and with the lighting and HVAC upgrades, after the first year of operation, it saved about 38% of the energy the library had used when it was air. We had to go back a few years to when it was air conditioned to use that. But it's a very good system, it's very expandable. It's got a control system in the director's office that is also expandable to whatever we need to do to, for the additions. So. I'd answer any other questions if you want. Yeah, I think the bones of the library are really pretty good, you know, so I think rather than building completely new, an entire new building, it's, it's helping us, you know, from a financial standpoint to, to renovate as well as build on. I have one, just one question you guys can help me with because it's hard for me to wrap my mind around the thought of 40 years ago we built a building 22,000 square foot and 10 years from now, we need an additional 8,000 square foot. And 10 years from now, we need additional 8,000, so 16,000 roughly total. Mm -hmm. That in 20 years, you're almost doubling what's been there for 40 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what I'm, and I'm trying to wrap my mind around the fact with technology and the, what, what I mean, you know, is it because the scope of the library's changed? Are we doing more? Yeah. I mean, obviously you did that. You've got a meeting room now with 200 people can go to, but mm -hmm. you know, you get these numbers and then you start thinking, okay, what's the cost feasibility for the city of Norfolk and how's that work? Mm -hmm. 
and where and not where do you where do you cut and save and, and so all these are all those questions are kind of going through my head but I guess the biggest one I mean is touch on it so that the public general public understands the reason to expand that much yeah. in a you know um, time frame the uh, there's two the two there's two reasons <laughs> the first one is definitely collection and as we mentioned you know some of that's crystal balling but uh, you know we've uh, we continue to see collections grow, and they're certainly growing now. Um, and as I mentioned, we're weeding more than we should be. So right now, we're not offering as much to the public as we could if we had the space for it. So um, collections is part of that. You know, it, you probably outgrew the library for collections. I know Jessica, you could probably help me more with this, but you know, way before last year. I mean, maybe ten plus years ago, um, that you've had to really start keep weeding. So you could only you'd have the newer materials available, um, but programs have changed so much, and a lot of that is because of technology. So libraries have always been kind of that you know living room of the community, and even more so today, because technology is causing a lot more of us to do this and be um, independent. Um, where libraries are offering more and more programs that and uh, you know meeting spaces and collaboration spaces where we all get together and it's so that's why it's becoming a lot more of a social um, collaboration um, I mean it's still and the way that kids study nowadays with technology you know they all they don't just do it by themselves at their computer they still get together in groups in fact group study rooms in, in a lot of communities have um, you know high tech technology in them so kids can go in there or college students whomever and put together you know you should see this stuff and you might be familiar I mean my kids are just getting into this now and it blows my mind but they the stuff that they put together for a class project is technology based but it's group um, collaboration that puts that together and the libraries are creating spaces where the community come can come together social educational or uh, business needs to make all that happen and, and the business we could go on and on about that especially small businesses are turning to their libraries a lot more they do not have a lot of the financial capabilities as startups to um, have the technology that they need to make their companies successful and they'll turn to the libraries often to you know to resource that so programs are huge I mean programs are taking over you know when we look at that future growth the program space is more than the collection space. So that's why when we pulled 10 years out of it, that was just 3,000 square feet for ten, <coughs> those last 10 years. It's really, and the program space is really the big part of it. And some of it is, you know, IT moved in and the library wasn't planned in 1977 for IT to be there. So that's a big chunk of space that they took over. And also they need a lot more space with the expansion of the server room more office space and definitely more storage and production space so it's mostly program no no does that does that help a little <laughs> yeah you've answered so many questions and, and still you know those are good questions about the IT space and and uh, is there a possibility I mean I know we've, there's a reason why I well maybe that's a good thing you guys can explain why is the IT located in the library is that something that is beneficial or is that <coughs> Because well, it's absolutely it was beneficial. That decision time. was made, Councilman, that's a great, great point. That, that decision was made uh, years ago already. And we, when we, as a community, as a world, brought into the technology world, we started to embrace that as a, as a city organization as well. And our ID, IT department, as any ID department, IT department has, is, uh, needs room. Needs room for servers, needs room for personnel, needs room for storage, needs room for maintenance issues, and the only room we had at that time was a library. So we remodeled the library, the back part of the library, and stole, for lack of better words, a lot of the space from the library, the library needs. So that their storage area basically was taken over by our ID, our fledgling ID, IT department. So that's what happened. So we remodeled that space. We have three personnel in there. We have all the the, the, the server equipment, all the all of our computer equipment in there, all of our maintenance facilities for our IT department is inside the library. A lot of folks maybe does, don't know that. But this concept here would allow us to expand that area and put them into a space that's really usable because they're kind of shoehorned in there, uh, for lack of better words, and uh, it's not very efficient space for them at all. Um, again, we took over a storage room and made, made offices out of it and. IT storage so the library lost that 
storage area and the IT department is bursting at the seams as well as the library is too so that's what happened and this would solve both sets of circumstances there for us one of the things I would point out is that uh, public libraries are growing because their programming are programming is expanding and the types of information that's passed is expanding too but we're seeing the same thing with university libraries I mean just the way we access information and the way we digest that in information as a community has changed dramatically and so so that again the programming space more than just the stack space is is what's really driving the growth both in the university setting as well and as the public library setting I think you might have you might have uh, said it best we're dealing in 10 years from now we're dealing with things that haven't even been invented yet mm -hmm. but they do tend to get smaller and smaller and hold more and hold more so I suppose the the programming side of it you know the, the public use side of it is going to be um, certainly going to overshadow the collection side is that a fair statement well it's just really interesting <coughs> because as as information has become more accessible in a device this large I think the need to understand that and and process that information as a community has expanded that's why so much of the education is happening in group learning like again when I when I was in school we worked on our individual projects and things like that but you go to most classes in school and and even in like in corporate settings where we're, we're ta doing corporate training it's done in groups and the way we even design office space now is oftentimes designed for collaborative workspaces so so really it is a reflection of we have so much information available to us so quickly but how we process that information how we use it is has changed dramatically and I guess for all of us who who long for more human interaction I mean from all of our kids sort of spending a lot of time on social media it really is driving people back to more face-to-face uh, uh, engagement that process the information that they're getting so and just as we kind of master plan as we looked at the layout and adjacencies and how we were kind of fitting out all of those programs into the library um, our goal is to make sure that the library stays as flexible as possible now and into the future because there's just technology is moving so rapidly there's no way we can crystal ball that that you know 20 years out so what we do is we make sure that we have the infrastructure in place, that all of our hard built walls are to the edges so that we can still, like the collection is really kind of denoting space as you might have noticed in the plan. So moving stacks is easy and, and cost effective. Um, so we make sure that um, it's planned in a way that you'll always have that flexibility both with the infrastructure so that technology can be throughout um, and with the actual structure making sure that you don't have to um, change a lot you know but it can be done with soft furnishings and collection Shane um, I know I've asked this question uh, but I want to ask it again more of a public forum are we we're past the point of moving the IT department over here financially I mean is it too big to move it is a major move I mean obviously anything can be done but it, it our server our, all of our infrastructure is located there for the most part for the IT department. So if, for in order to move all that, we're talking the moving of the fiber and all that to the supporting materials that go along with that would all have to come here. And then we don't have a large area here for storage either for all that equipment. So really, I mean, obviously it could be done. We have some office space here, but we don't have the storage area. And then the biggest driver is that infrastructure that is situated um, supporting our our IT and our server and our fiber network is at the library. So. Have we run the numbers on it? Oh, not in great detail. No, we have not. Would it would it be uh, hard to do? Mm, I mean, not not terribly hard. I mean, something we could work on if you would like us to. That's Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Might be nice to know. Good. Does this architectural design still hold for the ten-year growth plan? Yes. Yeah. What? What we did is just kind of uh, hold back that on the north side where the atrium space is. Uh, actually, you could probably leave it's it just, on the plan. It's basically yeah. just a line, you know. It would it would be taking this exterior wall and just moving it back to the south. It would kind of cut that courtyard in half. So it's not really a, a significant um, 
change to, to what the building looks like from the outside. And we should point out, like right at this point with the feasibility study, this is, you know, again, kind of uh, imagining all the possibilities. Um, it, if and when you moved forward, um, it could take on a, a different iteration by that time. So we tend to see things kind of change after <coughs> 30 years once uh, uh, you get moving on this. So this is kind of, we try not to get too uh, exact with the design. It's really more of conceptual at this point. Any other questions, Council? Okay. Well, thank you. Appreciate your all of you being here tonight. Um, again, I'm sure this con conversation is going to continue. There'll be a lot of conversation with within the elected officials, I'm sure. So, appreciate your work, though. Great presentation. Thanks all for being Thank here. You guys. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. You. you bet. Okay. We'll let you folks clear out before we bring up our next guest tonight, which will be a presentation by the real estate specialist from the United States Postal Service Facilities Implementation Team on what is going to be a suggested plan regarding the North Norfolk Post Office. Um, Angela, you want to come forward and, and I'll let you state your name and such. Tell us a little bit. Um, and for those of you that are here, this again is a presentation that is being made to certainly um, this body of elected officials. Certainly there's all of you that were well aware of the article that was in the paper and may have many questions. We're going to do this, though. We're going to look at the elected officials to hopefully ask some of those questions. Um, once she makes her presentation and the elected officials have had opportunity, we'll go forward with a couple other things on the agenda. And then there is an open comment period that will follow at the end of tonight's meeting that will allow you the opportunity to make comments. Again, this body cannot take action on those comments, but certainly you would be heard. So with that, if you will go forward. Thank you, Mayor Bookman and community leaders. Thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight and to meet with you and your community. My name is Angela Cole, and I'm a real estate specialist from Denver. I work out of the headquarters facility service office, and I support the postal service district offices across the western area over an 18 state region. With me this evening is Michael Monnington, the senior manager of postal operations for this district along with Postmaster Joe Kittleson. We appreciate the opportunity to come before you and share with you a proposed project relating to the Norfolk Lane Post Office. Our primary reason in speaking with you today is to advise you that this project is in the planning stages and to seek your input. As you know, like many other businesses and organizations, the United States Postal Service continues to be challenged financially by the tough national economy. In addition, the Postal Service is faced with declining mail volume and loss of revenue. With the popular use of email, online payment office options, and mailing habits, the business model for the Postal Service has changed. As a result, there has been a 25% reduction in mail volume over the last five years. In fiscal year 2012, the United States Postal Service posted a net loss of $16 billion. In fiscal year 2013, we added an additional loss of $5 billion more. For those of you who are not aware, the Postal Service receives no taxpayer support. We are 100% dependent upon revenue from the sales of stamps and our services to our customers. We have and will continue to make us to lower costs. <coughs> we have reduced employee work hours. We've reduced number of staff. We've frozen salaries of management at all levels, just to name a few of the steps that we have taken to address our financial concerns. We have also halted new construction of facilities. We've consolidated our mail processing operations, and we are selling unused or underutilized properties on a nationwide basis. Through all of this, we've continued to maintain our highest service levels ever, but still need to accomplish a major cost savings to improve the efficiency and productivity that assures our viability. As part of this effort, the Postal Service has established a facilities optimization program, which identifies buildings, 
facilities and own properties that we may, able, may be able to sell or consolidate so that our space can be used more effectively. We are sharing our proposal with you, our customers, in the early stages of this project so that you may provide us with your input. I have placed flyers out on the table outside of this room that has my contact information and I encourage, encourage members of the community to write to me over the next several weeks and provide me with their comments or concerns. Our proposed plan is to relocate the main post office from its current location on 4th Street to an owned facility located 1100 South Industrial Pine Road, 1.9 miles away. We would renovate a portion of that owned space that would provide the City of Norfolk a, a new, updated, modernized post office. After this meeting, I will be sending the mayor a letter regarding our plans moving forward. In that letter, I will advise that in addition to inviting comments, suggestions, and concerns, that the city or any member of the community <coughs> also has a right to appeal this project. They will have a right within 30 days of the date of that letter. We will post it, and not only send it to the mayor, we will be posting it in the lobby of the post office for the convenience of our customers as well. If the decision is to move forward, the mayor will be advised each step of the way, and we will, of course, allow ample comment periods. At this time, I would like to open the floor to any questions. I would like to have um, both Michael and Joe come up with me. I can, I can address any real estate and facilities-based questions. If there are any questions regarding um, operations specifically, they are the experts in that field. So, Thanks, Angela. And why don't we have each of you introduce yourselves, if you would, and explain to the... I'm Mike oh. Monington. I'm the senior manager of post office operations for the Central Plains District. My name is Joe Kettleson. I'm the postmaster here in Norfolk. Okay. Thanks, gentlemen. Um, about three and a half years ago, we really did a economic development boost here, bring jobs to town, retain jobs, bring jobs in. What can you tell us about the employment status? The current employees, the carriers, and of course any of the clerks, retail-based people that work out of the main post office would just be reporting to duty at the, um, at the location of the owned facility. There would be no loss of, of jobs relating to that. Can you tell me how many people go through the Norfolk post office a day to use your services? Well, we're probably looking at uh, probably five, six hundred people. Five, six hundred a day. If you move it two miles to the south, our town is moving to the north, west. It's going to put it quite a, quite a distance away. That's going to be a lot of inconvenience for the people of Norfolk. Do you guys look at that? I mean, when you see that you have 500 a day and you're going to push it two miles away from the people that are already driving two or three miles, is that going to affect your decision or...? Have you already looked at that? We, we've already looked at that. We are mandated to state when we're moving any type of a main post office that it impacts our customers. We are mandated to stay within a certain radius. And of course, um, 1.9 miles, although it, you know, most of the people I understand already drive to the post office here. It's not necessarily a walkable post office for most people. Um, and we are of the mindset that at this point, it is the planning stage. We are seeking that input from the community, but 1.9 miles within the current um, within the current place of the current post office isn't that extreme of a length to go. And we also have to remember that it's important that we implement these sound business decisions so that we can remain viable to the community mm -hmm. of Norfolk. And I understand the sound business for you mm -hmm. is to move it to a building you already own. I understand that, but I don't understand if you do your radius, some of the people are driving two to three miles to get to your post office, and if you go to the lesser populated part of Norfolk, they'll be driving five, maybe a little further. That, to me, doesn't sound like a sound business plan. Well, we keep in mind we do have several other options um, and, and service areas. Um, I believe there's approximately if within the if I'm recalling the report correctly, within um, the immediate vicinity, we have a lot of um, uh, service providers. I, I know you have the postal service. places that can buy stamps, but when I go down there and stand in line for a half hour, no matter what part of the day, 
we got people shipping packages and picking up mail all the time. That, I don't know if you have very many in town that can do that besides the one. Both of the high bs can uh, you can mail packages at okay. by stamps and also Lloyd's Drug Mart here in town. You can buy but you can't pick up packages there? No. No? no okay. Okay. That was going to be my, my comment. If you could elaborate a little bit on the use of satellite facilities, but you already touched on that, so thank you. Is there any other changes in service that we're going to see with this, or? Actually, this particular concept, although it's, again, in the planning stages, um, we feel that it will allow us to be more effective and more effic um, efficient with our time. We will have everything under one roof, as opposed to waiting for the delivery truck to come to the main post office, which um, I understand has, has pushed the delivery time of the mail back quite a bit. We're hoping that this will allow us to serve the community more quickly than we currently are able to do. So there's a strong possibility that it's not gonna be 10.30 in the morning then before we pick up mail? It certainly would allow us to be more operationally efficient. Um, in order to have everyone in lo centrally located in one place, it would, it would truly allow us to be able to service the needs of the community much better. From my opinion and some of the people that call me every day uh, talking about that, a lot of people in Norfolk think that we run the post office and then they criticize us for our packages going clear to Omaha now and coming back and standing in line and blah, blah, blah. Um, I see it going the other way and I hope it does change. And I and Jim do represent the northwest corner of town, so you are moving further away from our people. And, and I have had quite a few phone calls, and they are already kind of in protest mode because it's a long way, and it's harder to get down to that part of town. So I just want to put that on the record. If you need us to write a, a letter, I can you know, tell everybody in our ward to do it, and I can certainly do it. But that's what I'm hearing, and, and that's just coming from my ward, which is the northwest corner. So... Absolutely, please. Um, I encourage the letters to come in. I, I, I am here. This is the beginning part of this project, and I'm here to seek the community input. Um, you know, again, my, my address and my information is on the table outside. I'll, of course, share it with the mayor's office. Um, and it will, any letters, any official letters will also be posted for the convenience of our customers in the lobby. My question would be with this venue tonight that you're using to explain what's going on, is this more of a here's the inevitable tonight or or is this an opportunity that we can actually because I mean you've made you stated the business model that you're going to mm -hmm. try to follow and that's all pushing everything east mm -hmm. now obviously our protests or what we are our complaints or even I shouldn't say complaints but accessibility to our current uh, post which is just right over there mm -hmm. you know and I know nobody wants to see that move obviously none of us do because mm -hmm. it's that's where it's been and we don't want to see change but are we looking, you know, I mean, is this more of a venue just saying, hey, here's what's coming along, well, do what you can, or, I'm sorry, no. but it's just a, you know. I know, no, in, in fact, this is, again, it's a proposed pro project. This is the very initial stages. This is where I come out, I announce to the community what we're planning, we seek the input. The very next step will be, we will formally outline the project and send it to the mayor's office, let the community know that this is the project, and, and we, we are very careful to let everyone know they have the right to appeal. We ask that they write us as far as what the um, basis of the appeal happens to be, and we will take all of that into consideration. I read every letter that comes to me, and, and I do take that very se seriously because you are our customers. Um, at the same time, we are in a position of having a 32,000 square foot post office that we lease. We technically only need 20,000 square feet of space to do that, that same operation. On the other side, we have an owned facility. That facility happens to have 58,800 square feet of space, and 38,600 of that is excess space that we do not utilize. So when you can go from a, from a facility that's leased, and I know that it was published in the paper that we have a lease of $50,000 per year, and everyone, I'm sure, thinks, well, that's not bad. Well, it's not, because that particular amount that we have is actually very below market. It was a lease that was signed several decades ago that assured us that rate. That rate, we have a very limited time on that. And then that rate for the lease itself, would, would we would expect it to go up quite a bit, substantially. 
On top of that, of the 50,000 we currently pay in lease figures per year, we also pay about 21,000 plus in tax reimbursement to the landlord. And we have about $42,000 a year in utility costs for that building. So it's, it's when you start to factor all of that in and the cost savings and knowing that we can go to a space that is owned where we will not, we're already paying the utilities, but we will not have the cost <coughs> of the lease associated and we're more effectively using space that we already own. Again, it's just a sound business decision and that's where we're coming from in regards to this project. One other question I would have a concern that I see because I've used that facility out there to drop mail off. With it being the dead end of a one-way in your conceptual plan is there a chance to have through traffic to Michigan possibly or so that you have more than one way in and one way out because I see that being a bottleneck no, I, I mean I brought that up to this to the mayor and, and other council members that we would like to do something like that I mean it's in I can bring it up to the architects and And it's certainly something that, again, once we, if we go through, and once we go through this portion, which is the community contact, it's reaching out, getting the input from the, our customers and from the city leaders. And at that point, if the decision is to move forward, those are all things that we would certainly take into consideration and may already have in the planning stages. And maybe, maybe in your conceptual, you could have a bicycle trail on your property to the new trail. <laughs> 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 So if you were to move down to the southern location, any chance stamps might go back to 38 cents? <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to Talking write to the wrong. General, every congressman for that answer. <laughs> Angela, uh, a couple questions for you. Okay. And again, as you've presented it, this is in a very preliminary stage. Uh, uh, looking at input from what I'm hearing from from the public both addressing concerns that they have and then a possible appeal periods uh, if everything went forward at just a normal rate um, what kind of t I mean are we, are we talking about 2020 or 2015 uh, or uh, just gut feel on that most of the projects in general will will take a few months for me to you know go through a community contact process and assuming it moves forward from that that point most um most projects are completed depending upon the um, complexity but they would be completed within a nine month to 12 month period so on the outside we're looking we would be looking at this process um up to a year from now Angela, you made it I'm sorry. You made a remark <coughs> as far as reading each and every concern or comment that may come your way. Do you respond to them just so we can let the, the folks know what to expect if, in fact, they pick up this piece that you're putting out there for them? And, and as well, I was just talking with our um, city attorney, and we'll ask, if possible, to actually have this on our website for those that are not here tonight and able to pick this up. Maybe we can make that available if they do have the desire to. How do you respond to those, though? Is it just a, an overall? Well, um, keep in mind, I'm here to receive comments, and unfortunately, sure. because of my, my workload um, in that western area of 18 states, I'm not able to personally respond to specific questions, or, but I am here to listen to the community, listen to the concerns, advise the decision makers, the feedback that I okay. receive. And please, by all means, we encourage your office to distribute this information where we want to be very open um, okay. We want everyone who has an opinion and wants to share it to send it in so that it is read and it is taken into consideration. I am just unfortunately not able to answer every letter that comes in to me. Okay, so if I'm understanding you right, then you're going to respond back to the mayor's office to advise of the concerns that you've heard, mm -hmm. and then we can give acknowledgement to our public. Absolutely. Okay, very good. I just want to make sure we're clear on the expectations. Okay. So would you restate your appeal process? What does an appeal mean? Okay. Well. The, there is a letter that, that goes out, we, we refer to it as the initial decision letter. It will reiterate the project that we've proposed, and it will also outline that, it, that the, there is a right to the city and to any individual citizen 
to submit an appeal of this decision. We ask that they, it doesn't have to be very formal, but we do ask that it's in writing and they provide us reasons as to why they are appealing. They will have a 30 day period to do that formal appeal. That letter will again be sent to the city, posted on the website would be wonderful. It will of course be available to the media and it will be posted in the lobby of the post office for our customers. Again, it's a simple, um, they can write, they can give us the reasons as to the appeal and then that appeal, if there is one, it would be basically reviewed and, and the final decision will rest with the Vice President of Facilities in Washington, D.C. Question for you, Angela, also in, in the letters that you're accepting, I, I, you know, I, I keep hearing the appeal process and, and uh, you know, if you feel you're aggravated by it, uh, are you, I'm assuming you're also open if I'm supportive of this thing. Absolutely. Uh, you know, because I, I, I look at it somewhat in a, in a business model the same way that we as a city looked at, at uh, you know, joining our facilities all together in one place. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it just becomes a whole lot more efficient for, for us when we moved all of this space. And I, I hear the presentation of the postmaster about the efficiencies of, you know, moving mail from there to here and being able to get it out sooner. Um, I remember the days well when 8, 8.30 was the latest that mail was out and, and now it's 10.30, but I also understand why it's there too, so. Well, we certainly love to get letters of support. Um, you can imagine that a lot of people will write if they um, have an objection, but many people who are accepting of it and actually support it don't often take the time to write and let us know that. But we are here to literally listen to the input of the city leaders and the community, good, bad, or indifferent. And so I encourage anyone that has any comments or concerns, please write to me. They are read, they are taken into consideration. And I just wanna say one of the main reasons when we moved here that I considered was that we are across the street from the post office. <laughs> Social security offices across the street, <coughs> libraries across the street, High school's right here, so Beth can walk over and drop off the mail if she has to rather than drive. <laughs> so there, it is centrally located. It is a couple blocks from downtown Norfolk, and, and it, it is very accessible for Norfolk. So I want to reiterate that again. I know a lot of people have told me, you know, let's don't move it clear out of town, basically. So I'm going to reiterate that again, tell you how close it is to downtown, which you already know that, but I want to, I want to make that on the record also. So. Well, and I understand your town, of course, is, and very positively so, is expanding. And we can't necessarily say what will or will not be in the area that we are moving, um, you know, we would be moving to. However, you know, as a business decision, it just makes sense to not pay for lease space when we have an owned facility available. And that's the primary reason we're, we're basing that. It will allow us to be more effective, more efficient, and more viable to your community. I'm getting the feeling that the decision's already made. You're just kind of telling us what's going to happen, but <coughs> it does make sense as a business, and I understand that again. But to me, it looks like it's already done, so I appreciate is, that, though. This is truly a planned project. It actually came back um, a couple months ago, and my schedule didn't allow me to be here sooner, but it is literally a planned project. I have to go and will go through all of these steps, and if I would have... You know, we have to start somewhere, and this is where we're starting. And I can't change your mind if you want to feel like it is a done deal because I know what I have to go through mm -hmm. and what I have to do. We are under the community relations regulations. It's very, <coughs> it's a federal law. We take it very seriously, as well as the input of our customers we take very seriously. So it may sound like I'm giving you general, a lot of general information, but I'm also giving it to you specifically to why we came to this decision as far as having this planned project. But it is truly a planned project and this is just the initial stage to reach out to the community, get you involved and get your feedback. At the end of the day, we will have to look at this and look at all of the comments and the reasonings and make an informed business decision. I don't make that decision ultimately it is made by someone else, but it is something that <coughs> allows us to start this process, let you know we have this plan, and get your feedback. Thank you. Okay. One comment I do have, because that is that facility is in my ward, 
is the safety issue with coming on and off of Omaha Avenue. And if you do come through some of those neighborhoods, there's a lot of kids down there. And I know what this looks like in the morning, in yeah. 3 o'clock and at 12 o'clock and at 5 o'clock. So I'll just make you aware of that because safety is a huge issue. I appreciate that. If this project is implemented, it's something that this is one of the reasons we work, reach out to the city leaders because we want to work in partnership with the city to provide our services to the customers. And so we, we would be open to discussions on all of that. Thank you. Any other comments, questions, concerns to express? <coughs> Any? All right. I think you probably have laid this out very well. Again, um, we will talk with our webmaster and see if we can't get this information out there. And as well, I think that's a great idea. Um, I'm sure Jessica would be more than happy to post it for us at the library as well. She's got a lot of folk that come through there. So um, again, folks, just understand you have absolutely the right to appeal what has been suggested. And it's gonna be up to our citizens to certainly make the comments, whether nay or for, to allow the process to be put in place. So I appreciate all three of you coming and being before us tonight. Um, again, if there's more that we need to do as the city in, in helping to make sure that everybody is aware of the true plan, let us know. We'll be glad to help you out. Seeing nothing more, thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Thank you. I will remind you, if you want to stick around till the end of the meeting, we might have some public comment as well from some of the citizens that are here. So with that, we're going to go forward with the regular agenda. Um, we're going to jump back to consideration of approval of the Trail Advisory Board's recommended trail improvements for fiscal year 2014-2015. I'll make the motion, Your Honor. Second. I have a motion with a second. Any further discussion on that at all? All right. What, if, uh, when, I just I'm sorry. Question. On that trail, on the trails, uh, what is our time frame there? It, granted, it all goes through and whatnot tonight. We're, what are we we're looking work, at start date, I guess? We're working uh, with the property owners now and securing uh, either permanent easement or a fee, simple fee title on that, uh, on the properties that are involved in this. There's three or four different pro private property owners that own the property currently. So as soon as that goes through, you know, my goal, personal goal, uh, I've told the staff towards is to shoot towards fall and have it in and fall, but I don't, you know, there's a lot of work to do. And there's one thing that's out there is, you know, there's not a, not a lot of paving contractors are, there's a lot of them, but they're all very busy. So we don't know what that's gonna happen with, with the project as well. So we hope to have it in by fall but um, it could be spring or next summer as well. So we're gonna do our best. Fair question, anything else, council? If not, then please vote. All council members voting in the affirmative, motion carries. All right, and next we're looking for consideration of approval of ordinance number 5285, annexing property located at 1230 West Monroe Avenue Ordinance number 5285 passed, if you remember, on first reading only at the March 3rd City Council meeting. So again, if I could have a motion to move forward on the second reading. Your Honor, I'd move that we consider Ordinance 5285 on second reading. Second. Okay, we have a motion with a second to approve on second reading. Any discussion? If not, short title. An ordinance of the city of Norfolk, Nebraska to annex to said city a part of the south half of the north half of section 34 and part of the northwest quarter of section 34, all located in township 24 north, range one west of the sixth principal meridian, Madison County, Nebraska. All right, please vote. All council members voting in the affirmative ordinance 5285 carries in second reading. All right. Next would be con consideration of ordinance number 5286, <clears throat> amending section 25 of the city code to increase the fee for municipal solid waste received at the city of Norfolk transfer station by $3.45 per ton to $56 <coughs> with the change taking effect June 1, 
2014. <coughs> can oh, a little background. Hang on just a second. Can I have a... I did introduce ordinance 5286 on first reading. Second. Okay, we have a motion with a second. You're on. All right, thank you. Excuse me. On January 21st of 2014, the City Council approved the renewal of the transportation contract that went into effect on February 3rd. This uh, transportation contract increased the cost of shipping of trash from the City of Norfolk transfer station to the landfill. The increased cost of shipping equates to an additional $62,275 for the remainder of 2013-14 fiscal year. A public works subcommittee had a meeting on February 27th of this year and recommended forwarding a $3.45 increase per ton to the city council to vote on, which would raise the cost of disposal to $56 a ton. With the current government figures of each household generating two tons of trash per year, this price increase would affect the average customer by an additional 58 cents per month. This increase would not affect any waste that was not destined to the landfill. We would appreciate the council actions to be able to implement this rate increase on June 1st, 2014, if they so desire. <coughs> okay. One quick, when was the last rate increase? The last rate increase yeah. was 2008. Thanks. And do you know how much that was? Brian? That was two dollars. That was strictly due to the cost, the rise in shipping costs. So basically, the same thing. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Any other questions for Rob? While we have him before you? I'll, I'll just make a comment on. I was on the subcommittee for this uh, issue and uh, it just like like what I saw what Rob showed us in the slides the trends if we wouldn't have had a couple hailstorms in the last two years we'd have been making this decision a couple years ago the tonnage that we had from the hailstorms actually made up our shortfall uh, uh, from from the fee schedule so Another no, question. I'm not I saying that. That's what saying. That's what he was saying. I hope we don't get any more hailstorms. I tell you what, there must not be any insurance folk out here, or they'd be up talking. Yeah. So, any but other questions at all? I, I just was pointing out that that's probably delayed the delayed the decision. All right, thanks, Rob, for being here. Any other further discussion at all, Council? If not, do we have a short title on this, Beth? Oops. <coughs> there we go. Guess not. Yeah. I, okay. An ordinance of the City of Norfolk, Nebraska, to amend, amend Section <clears throat> 2 5 of the Official City Code to include a fee increase for municipal solid waste to provide when this ordinance is in full force and effect. All right. And with that, please vote. All council members voting in the affirmative ordinance 5286 carries on first reading. Your Honor, I move that we pass this ordinance on second and third, suspend the rules. Second. We have a motion with a second <coughs> to suspend the rules and pass ordinance number 5286 <coughs> on second and third reading. Any further discussion? If not, again, please vote. All council members voting in the affirmative. Ordinance 5286 carries on second and third. All right. And with that, it is now public comment period. Anyone that would want to come forward and make a comment, concern, um, address this council, please feel free to do so. We'd ask you to come to the microphone, state your name for us, and as well, um, make your comment. Again, this body can take no action, but we're certainly here to listen. How are you? Great. You're you're elected, huh? <laughs> yeah. Um, my name is David Peterson, and I'd like to address the uh, postal concerns. Um, also, uh, we must remember that the post office is a nonprofit organization. 
first of all. They also are uh, have a um, budget of $5.5 .5 billion each year uh, to prepay their retirement. And last year they said that they had a $5 billion uh, shortfall. You know, so they probably did have a profit, but having to pay that $5.5 billion uh, up front with that, um, that would be not a bad thing to have. If you didn't have that, they would probably have showed a profit last year. Also, uh, one might want to know why they now have room for this uh, movement down there. Uh, the uh, automatic facial cancer system uh, machine has been moved to Omaha. That has freed up some of the space that is now presently down at the other building. That is why your mail is no longer being canceled in or for it is all being canceled in Omaha. So you put that delay in transportation to Omaha and then back with it being processed there uh, for the cancellation part of it. And then we, we uh, delivery point sequence the mail here at the North Fork office. If you did not have that delay, your mail would be in North Fork and be able to uh, be in the boxes by eight o'clock versus 10 o'clock. So, you know, this, this is something that we've also uh, incurred in, in this movement is late mail. Um, also, uh, a few years back, we met out at the Lifelong Learning Center talking about the closure of this processing center. Uh, the logistics of that with the present contract with the APWU, uh, they're only able to move their, or kind of forcibly move their employees about 50 miles. With that right now, uh, the contract standing, that, that isn't feasible. Uh, the contract is now coming due. Uh, I believe they'll start negotiations February of next year. So that may change that uh, distance. So you then have the employees that are presently at the processing center may have to move where their jobs are. So uh, that's something to consider. You know, this is totally off the subject of this building here, but I wanted you to know why your mail is being late where you normally don't have it. Um, also, I believe if you really want to make a comment, you would be best to serve to contact the uh, Postal Regulatory Commission. The PRC.gov is the uh, uh, web address, the www.prc.org, or .gov, excuse me, and uh, that would probably give you better service and, and uh, response and they, they have to comment back to you and so forth. Um, and then there's also an address for that, and I do have that out in my car. I forgot to bring it in. Um, let's see if there's anything else I wanted to speak about. Um, that's pretty well it. Um, I think we'd be better served if, uh, oh, uh, there was a comment that the <coughs> mail would be up to this post office sooner, or you would get the mail sooner maybe about 10 minutes in the amount of time it takes to take the mail from the machines and truck it up here um, is that that's how much sooner you're going to get your mail versus you know it's going to go across the, the building versus across town and that's the, uh, the amount of time savings you're going to get i'm making an assumption you're an employee yes I am. okay very good all right but that's that's all i have very good thank you mr peterson Anyone else that wants to come forward? Hello, my name is uh, Rick Whipperling. At first when I kind of heard this, I thought, well, heck, let's make the post office into the new library or, or an annex library of some sort. But <laughs> then I figured out, oh, heck, we're renting that. I was curious, who, who owns that property that, we're, that the post office is renting it? Then I did have a comment on that, that they skipped a retirement uh, payment, but that's all. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Whipperling, thank you. Anyone else that wants to come forward?
going once. If no one else has it from out there, I wanted to make a comment. Certainly. Uh, first off, I just wanted to bring to att everyone's attention, and there was already a letter in the paper, but I was made aware of this through an email from Todd Ryan with Big Red Kino. And Saturday, March 1st, a Big Red Kino had a customer who suffered a heart attack. And the staff were able to start CPR with the use of an automated external defibrillator that they have on site. And uh, Big Red Kino is required, or they, they require all their managers to take training, and every Big Red Kino in the state is required to have one of those machines. This individual's heart stopped. They were able to start his heart again with this machine. Uh, there was a paramedic and a nurse on, on site that happened to be eating there that continued CPR until paramedics arrived. And uh, I guess sometimes uh, in day-to-day -day life, we take things for granted. And, and I just wanted to take a minute and point out what a great partner that Big Red has been to the community uh, up to this point from the time that, that the voters passed Keno. Big Red has infused about $2.1 million into our community. And uh, I guess as of this weekend, they've infused about $20,000 into Memorial Field through the sale of Memorial Field Burgers. And that's on top of what they pay in occupation and beverage tax. So I just, I just wanted to give, give a accolades to that, that organization. Of they've, they've been a great partner. And then the other thing I wanted to bring up was uh, I just want to say hats off to the Norfolk High School basketball team, um, the public school system, and the whole town of Norfolk. We went down to Lincoln a couple times this weekend for the state basketball. And it, it's always a sense of pride to see the number of people that follow when we're playing schools that have twice the enrollment that we have and we have twice the people, twice the student body, twice the band, twice the Pink Panthers. It, it, it really makes, it makes you proud to be part of Norfolk and my hat's off to them and the product that they put out. Everyone in Norfolk should be very proud, so. Well said, Dale, well said. Anyone else with any comments before we adjourn? No, they're further north. <laughs> oh, I tell you what. With that, we're adjourned. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>